Bye. Melissa, um, what a joy to meet you and what an extraordinary book, Paul Newman, The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man, that you and your sisters have created. I mean, I found it so profound and so moving and there's so much to talk about. Um, so thank you very, very much for joining me. Thank you for having me. Do you want to introduce yourself? <laughs> Shall I introduce you? I said no one's no one's asked me to do that so far. Boy, I don't know where I would start. Uh, probably better if you introduce me. I want to hear what you have to say. <laughs> well, uh, uh, well, I don't. I, well, I, what's interesting is I feel like I know you through the book, and I don't know you at all. We've never met, so there's right. a there's a sense of connection, although um, I don't know you. So Melissa Newman, known as Lissy is the middle daughter of Paul and, jo Paul and Joanne Woodward. She wrote the foreword to her father's memoir, The Extraordinary Life of an Ordinary Man, and with her sisters helped compile the transcripts that became the memoir. She is an American artist, teacher, singer, and former actress. Do you want to add anything to that? Uh, the former actress is really minimal. I, I, I appeared peripherally in a couple of films that my parents... Um, we're in because there were a lot of sort of family enterprise where if they needed a warm body or somebody that looked like uh, looked like my mother, I was able to step in. But I really, you know, I can't. I was in one television show with my mother. Um, my Wikipedia page conflated me with several other people named Melissa Newman. I do get sometimes fan mail for things. I, you know, apparently I was on Perry Mason and Bonanza, but I, I, I don't remember doing those things at all. So I don't think I did them, but, um, <laughs> but, but I am an artist and a singer and, you know, by tr people say, Oh, didn't you want to be an actress? Like, no, absolutely not. That would be like sticking a gun in your mouth in my family. Um, you know, the, to little, the, the competition, a little too direct there. Um, but, there's, there's a um, whole... and also conversation that we could have about that that is <laughs> I'll come back book. yeah I'll, uh, yeah I'll come back and lie down on a couch one day and we can we can have that whole discussion <laughs> um yeah the book is you know the book is really a revelation but also for the record that um the book was compiled the the transcripts were compiled by a very close friend of the family named Stuart Stern who he was a screenwriter he wrote the screenplay for Rebel Without a Cause Great um, film. For, yeah, amazing. And he, um, he, and several, he was a t television screenwriter. He wrote the screenplay for Sybil. He, he and my father met because he wrote a, a television screenplay back in the days of left live TV. Um, so um, that's how they met. He met my father 12 days before my father met my mother. And then wow, I always said. That's interesting. Yeah. And I think that was something I found in the, I found out in the transcripts um so i did find out things you know it, you know fascinating but so he met my my father and then my father met my mother and then i think stuart as you know as a friend was really jealous because he became really enamored of my father very quickly and but then i he and my mother became incredibly close and i always felt like what bound them together was the shared difficulty and complexity of loving my father and so they, I, I feel like that was part of the glue and foundation of their relationship, she and Stuart. But my middle name is Stuart. My son's middle name is Stuart. He was my sister's godfather. Um, my son's godfather, he um, was ordained as a minister so he could actually conduct the marriage of my husband and I. So he was really, I, I can, there's no way to describe my relationship to Stuart. There's no words except he, he feels like a bodily organ. Um, and he's so intimately intertwined with, with our family. And he was the one who really um, spearheaded this effort. I, I'm sure that my father mentioned something about maybe wanting to write a memoir. And Stuart, who is an incredible um, interviewer and, and researcher because of his experience as a screenwriter, uh, jumped in with both feet. And it's, I can really hear that he's a central part of your family. I mean, maybe not by blood. Yes but by love, by the depths of love yes, that you yes. have and trust. And that this book feels like an act of love um, from 
your dad, to you and to us readers, I think, actually, about trying to make sense of the world, trying to tell a truth that hasn't been told. And, and the, the way he transcribed the recordings and stored them, and they did get fined many years later, is another act of love, really. And then your act of love, you sisters, in putting this book together. Um, and so the, the kind of the first question that I always ask a guest on my on my show is tell me about a challenge you're facing or have had to face. And, and, and you know, I wonder what that is. Well, against the backdrop of um, the difficulty of, you know, the complexity of, of, you know, developing one's ego, you know, given the fact that people are looking past you and through you and, and, um, I mean, I, I kind of feel like you can fill in some of the blanks about how complicated that is, but the, you know, the, the, Probably Can I the... pause you? So when you say people looking past you and through you is that when you're with your dad, no one looks at you. They just look at your dad or your mum. Oh, it's just it's um, it's it's so complicated. And when you're very, very young, I feel like when I was, you know, when I was very young, I you know, five years old, it's like having a magic trick where you um, you discuss you you see if you can turn the discussion so that somebody will ask you what your father does and then all of a sudden the room stops and everybody gives you attention. And imagine having that in your back pocket when you're five years old or six years old and yeah. and then trying to wrestle with, with tamping that down or putting it in context as you get older. And then as your parents, you know, my parents losing, rel losing relevance, um, it's important to understand that that, you know, that, that magic trick is not relevant. So, you know, just, just trying to, you know, find yourself and, and, you know, find out who you are. And so I'd say actually the the difficulty at hand is, um, you know, I'm 61 years old and I, I, you know, I really would like to do me. Um, you know, I've got two kids, I got an amazing husband, I'm an artist, I, you know, and I have no desire to be famous um, because, uh, movie, uh, being a movie star is a really terrible blueprint for adulthood. Um, there is no, there's no road to that. I mean, if your parents are actors on the stage, it's even, you know, it's, it's simpler, but, uh, my friend, the producer, Emily Wachtel, who was, um, who was, um, really instrumental in making this, both the book and the documentary about my parents that's out right now on Sky happen, um, I grew up with her. She's an incredible producer. We were lucky that, you know, good friend who was really integrated into the family. She was one of those, uh, you know, chosen sisters. Um, her father was a shoe designer and I was so jealous because they had a, they had a, there was, you know, they would work in the mall at the shoe stores and then they would, you know, and I wanted to be part of their family I wanted to just have parents that you know a dad that was a shoe designer so that I could say well okay well here's the you know here's what you do in order to be an adult but movie stars they you know there's no it's it's a it's a unicorn because in a so, way what you're saying is if you ask yourself the question and ask yourself who am I it's such a complex answer because in some ways you want to be Melissa, who is an artist, who is a woman, who is a mother, who is going about her life. And yet you have these multiple additional identities that are related to your mum and your dad and people's relationship to them. And there seemed to be in with your father in the book, a parallel process where he was trying to work out his relationship with love, with life, with luck and his own identity and this kind of um, agony and pain that lived with him the entire time of having this kind of deserted orphan uh, version of himself that had been kind of pulverized by his mum, as far as I could make out, with this beautiful face that people worshipped at. And I guess there's part of that with you, that you felt the worship that he had, but you also felt it towards yourself being his daughter. <clears throat> 
Yes, it's um, it's a whole struggle with, am I important? Am I not important? Do I matter? Do I matter? And why do I matter? And then, um, you know, I mean, I like, I always like to, my, my favorite mantra is, is speck of dust, speck of dust, speck of dust. I'm a speck of dust in the universe. And, um, and, and I actually find that very comforting. It is. <laughs> um, and I still, you know, I've, I've come to a place where, and I have to say this process of, of promoting the book, um, creating the book from these transcripts, I mean, it's been an incredible journey, but I have to have it in this really complicated context of, I, I'm at a place in my life where I can just appreciate, objectively appreciate my parents, their struggles. Um, I can appreciate their work um, at, at a remove. I still have situations just literally right before cause I'm filling in for my little sister. She was supposed yeah. to make this trip and, and, uh, I had two hours to pack my suitcase. Wow. And so, um, she's really good. She's really good at this. She has more experience doing these things than I do. Um, doing my fine. little sister, Claire. Oh, wow, even. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, so, um, so, oh, you're going to have to keep me on track because I have terrible so attention even deficit before, disorder, for the record. Um, so even before you, you've kind of had a whole relationship with doing the book and now promoting the book and just before you came on the call, yes. something Oh, happened. yes. So as you know, I, I was, as I was leaving to jump on a plane, which I, I, I didn't think really was going to happen, they're like, you're going to have to go to London. <laughs> I said, like. I, I said, you can put my name in the hat if it's an emergency. And here we are. Um, and um, so I was in my, I was in the studio and the um, sculpture studio where I do all of my work. It's, it's a, it's a school. So there are a bunch of people there and um, there was somebody, it happens every once in a while. Most, most everyone knows my, my, my Petri dish, as I call it, my, you know, who my family is. And there were, we were talking about, you know, the book and the, you know, and then how I was going to maybe have to jump on a plane and go to London. Um, and there were a couple of people in the room that said, what are you talking about? Who are your parents? You know, and that happens every once in a while. And at this point, unlike you know, I'm not a five-year-old, so I'm not going like, oh, good, I get to have all the attention on me. Um, but I'm I'm perfectly happy because at this point, people are so tickled by it. It's I, it's nothing but like you know, bringing a smile to people's faces. It's a little bit of joy. It's their it's you know, these are their my parents' accomplishments, not mine. I understand that, um, and so. You know, I just right before I came here, I, I, it happens all the time, and they people are like, oh, I can't believe that, and you know, and, and it was great. They smiled, they had a good time, um, you know. But you know, trying to come to peace as I'm an artist making my own work, um, you know, with my you know self self worth and all of that, and who am I as an artist? I think actually the book, um, the this my the saddest thing about these transcripts in the book I found out a lot I knew a lot I found out a lot uh, somebody reminded me that Stuart had asked my mother in the transcripts he had said um, Paul who do you think knows you best or no he said to my mother um, who do you think knows you best and I was so this is one of those moments reading the transcripts where my mother said I think your I think your children I think my uh, his daughters know him better than he thinks they do, and I that was a so wonderful moving. moment to read. Yeah, it was almost as wonderful as when my father looked at me and said, "said to my husband and I, you've broken the cycle of bad parenting." <laughs> <laughs> so, so, and I, you know, I beg to differ. Honestly, uh, you know, my little sister and I speak about this all the time. They, she, she was the one who really focuses and pointed out that. This, these transcripts are a moment in time and that my father, as we all are, was in a, you know, he was evolving. We're all evolving. Some people stop and don't evolve and I give him credit because he really did. And I always wonder how this process of putting this book together being, you know, Stuart really dug. He really dug for answers and they, yeah, yeah. you know, his, his, um, because his, voice Stuart's voice is sort of taken away my father's often sounding a bit punchy answering things um I feel um because Stuart was really digging 
and in ways i think sometimes my my father was sort of pushing back saying i know i'm jumping all over the place because this is how i roll you just have to follow me around like you know it's a i'm following you should i pause you should i, answer, I pause you in a for a moment and to tell you where i yeah, got sure. to with what, <laughs> what you're saying yeah, good luck yeah okay <laughs> Well, I think, I mean, I think the theme of what you're talking about is to do with how our relationship with ourselves and with the important, significant people in our life, our parents, is an ongoing, iterative, evolving relationship. But when they are very famous parents, that brings a level of both stardust and to other people, a kind of joy and massive curiosity, but also... Um, a kind of confusion in your own self-worth and it feels like now that you're 61 and actually probably through do, writing the book together you're it's still evolving you know our relationship with our parents continue well after they've died and your dad died in 2008 didn't he and what yeah. I what I've kind of curious about is you know he talked about he didn't know what his core is and that that sense of anesthesia, that he was kind of blocked and frozen, he was an observer on his life and really felt alive by parts when he was given a script is what I under, kind of understood from the book. And what I felt was that there was totally unrecognized transgenerational trauma that came down from probably his great grandparents, certainly his grandparents, his parents to him and to some extent to your brother Stuart, who died of a drugs overdose. No, Scott. Scott. I'm Scott. Yeah. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah I'm getting in a yeah. muddle. Yeah, Scott. No, it's fine. Um, and that was my kind of take on it: that there was so much trauma that everyone was battling to anesthetize and block these huge bursts of pain. Your mum from her, her, your grandmother from her mum dying being a re Jewish refugee, coming to the U.S., building a business. This and your grandfather was an alcoholic, your dad was an alcoholic, Scott was a an addict. Um, does that make sense for, for you, that kind of narrative of tr transgenerational patterns of trauma that get dealt with through, through using mechanisms to block them? Um, it's, it's, I think one of, you know, one of the m most interesting things in the book, and it's interesting that you take it back so many generations and, um, you know, my, especially that my, uh, my Jewish roots, um, I'm married to a Jewish man and, and so I'm sort of deeply, I mean, you know, not, not raised, neither of us raised with much Religiously. religion, but cert but certainly cultural, culturally. Um, I think it's really interesting to take it all the way back. And one of the things that, um, I learned in the transcripts that, you know, the, the book could have been. 6,000 pages. I mean, it's, you know, the, the, the editors had to decide on a certain narrative and I think they, they really chose an interior, a very interior, certain, somewhat, you know, they really focused on the self doubt and the, and there, and it's there. And I think it is interesting. And I think it's a, it's a teachable moment, you know, and, and we're talking about relevance and, and I think, you know, that was, there are a million books and probably a play or two in this, in the, these transcripts. But um, one thing I was sad was that that couldn't be included in the book because it would have been too long is that his own mother had already suffered through an abusive marriage um, before. So she was, you know, she was in recovery from that when she met, you know, when she met my dad's father and that that wasn't really you know that marriage wasn't his marriage to her I'm not really sure about how solid that was I know there was a lot of you know his father was wanted to be a writer and he was you know working in the in the um, family sporting goods store and there was just a lot of um, disappointment and as you say trauma I mean, I think that word is, you know, it's becoming watered down. And it means a lot of different things. But yeah, but there's some quite gen, you know, there is trauma. There is such a thing. And, and you know, some of that, some of the trauma was, you know, trauma light. And some of it was, was really, really heavy stuff. So she was recovering from her own trauma and she passed that on. 
Um, and my father, I think with my brother, um, I mean, oh, there's so much to talk about yeah. with all, with all of that, you know, but if we're going to take it all the way up to my brother, I mean, that was an untenable situation. The only son of a man who, you know, his history, you know, that his mother and that, that those three children were the collateral damage of, of my dad's inevitable relationship with my mother, which just, you know, the, he, was he and his first wife. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he, he and his first wife got married. They, they, both of them, to, you know, to escape certain things, they, they clung to each other. People find, you know, a ticket out and, um, you know, they may have had love and affection for each other, but my, what happened between my parents was, um, you know, it was a locomotive really. And, and, and I'm really sad that my dad wasn't able to sort it out a lot sooner because, you know, he was already having an affair with my mother, um, you know, through, you know, and, and as a married man. And I always say, you know, I wish he had sorted it out sooner, but at the same time then I wouldn't have my wonderful sister, Stephanie, who I adore. So um, as complicated as that was, and she also came to live with me when she was, you know, li live with our family when she was 14, eh, 14, I think about, yeah, she was having a rough time. And she, and she always says about my mother that my mother gave her her sisters. So oh, that's um, a lovely thing. But yeah, I think, you know, it, it really is. So there was some you know everybody was everybody was muddling through some back to gener generational trauma I, there was a there was an article in a magazine so i have i have two children and one of them i re, i sort of think of as mr sunshine and the second one i always say he was a c section baby he was in he was out life was easy you know and, and then the second one was a regular delivery and i wonder if that had something to do with it there was <laughs> the, the trauma of birth um but he was i refer I sort of used to think of him as my little hamlet um he's a you know he was a, a sort of a moody broody baby and i read an article about my my that was about very early on before my father and my mother when scott my brother scott was just born and in it the the um the interviewer says i walked into the room i, I walked into the apartment and his wife jackie was in the other room with their toddler who was having a tantrum and you know screaming screaming his head off and jackie says in the book and i i'm so thrilled that in the book is um is that my f father's first wife, Jackie, has a voice in the book because yeah. she's so clear-eyed. She was present for a part of um, his history that, you know, my mother wasn't present for and a very clear-eyed view. And I, I think she deserves a voice. But what I heard in this article was it, it just struck me all of a sudden, you know, so she, he walks, the interviewer walks in and Scott's having a huge tantrum and he's a toddler and, you know, n no, children don't come with an instruction booklet, as no, no. we know. Um, there were very few resources back then. People just had babies and then they dealt with it. And and um, I, I, it struck me so hard that when I was raising my child, you know, you know, allergies and he was just, you know, and he's grown up to be the, mo the loveliest, you know. Oh, he just, well, he, he. He really immersed himself. I planted the seeds, and he really has immersed himself in mindfulness and all these things. He's, he's actually a, he teaches me now. Great. Yeah, he's he's really he he's he's actually a comfort to me and a guide to me at this point, which is really beautiful. Um, but I had all these resources. I had you know my knowledge. So when Places my father, to go. yeah. Yeah, and my father said to me, you know, you broke the cycle of bad parenting. You know, um, I said to him, Dad. You know, you guys had, you know, Dr. Spock. That was it, you know. But, you know, and my mother gave me, I think, her dog-eared copy when I had babies. But they just, you know, we were in we have magazines, books. We the, you know, well, we didn't have the internet quite. I didn't anyways because I'm a Luddite. But, um, yeah, we had all kinds of, I had therapy. I mean, I, you know, and they didn't have anything. And I just, the, that moment reading that in that magazine, I suddenly got the whole picture of Jackie struggling with this complicated baby and then moving and they they had lived with in the house with his mother and and that his mother had been lonely she was pregnant and she was alone and that Jackie moved in and was pregnant and then that that 
my father's mother couldn't see, she couldn't get past her own stuff to see that she could have supported this other woman who was in the same position. So to your point of generational trauma, you know, if people had had more knowledge and more context, she could have, you know, his, his mother could have helped Jackie through her pregnancy. And it, it is, it's really, it's really tragic. And, you know, the good news is my, my parents evolved. I think my, my little sister and I always say that, you know, they, they really tried and they got better and better and that we probably were very lucky to get the best iteration and they were spectacular grandparents. So as one is. Yeah. I can really hear. Did I answer five questions for you now? <laughs> you, you answered really important question, which is the complexity of doing the best you can without knowledge, information, resources to go to. And in the context of where our parents, our grandparents were living to kind of really recognize they were doing the best they can and kind of hitting them with a sort of stick of blame or wanting to, them to have known what they couldn't have known or didn't have access to is actually quite self-harming on oneself because it keeps the the engine of anger and resentment going, whereas it sounds that you feel kind of calmer and self-compassionate towards yourself and your dad and your grandparents that they were doing the best they could given what they knew and who they were and what was happening to them. But also in recognizing that um, we change, you know, your mum and dad, as they got older, often we kind of think life changes and it gets smaller, but actually it sounds like your dad with, and your mother, with their enormous fame, didn't really feed their soul or their kind of inner being. Maybe your mum more, but we're talking about your dad in the, in the book mainly. But actually, as he aged, he did begin to feed his core and connect with himself. And I think that's a, you know, that's a very hopeful, encouraging note. Yeah, I think what the, what the book does and focuses on is the complication and the difficulty and I think the reason when it, one of the reasons that we felt like it was all right to move forward with the project although as a, you know my my father and Stuart have this fascinating meta discussion about how they want to construct the book I mean it's it's all in there there's you know there's a number of blueprints so that was really fascinating to read and a very, they had a very funny relationship, a wonderful relationship. Um, but, um, oh dear, where was I going with this? Um, I can't remember what we so you were talking about. How the, our a... relationship um, by having compassion and recognition of context change it. We, you know, blame is very damaging um, and that you kind of recognized that while he was sort of, they, and he changed and evolved as when he's, when he was so famous, that in some way was very difficult to live in. Oh, right. And now I, I remember what I was, what I was saying was, um, <clears throat> it's nice when I actually remember what I was saying, um, is that in the, you know, the reason that we felt comfortable making the book, um, was because there's been this fairy tale I find it so fascinating that this fairy tale of my parents, you know, the perfect marriage, 50 years in Hollywood is, you know, if anybody takes 30 seconds to think about it and anyone who's been married or had any kind of relationship and imagining that in the context of fame and Hollywood and all of that pressure, thinking that there could really actually be a, you know, a fairy tale that was that simple, it's kind of ridiculous. So. I think for a long time I felt like, oh, the world needs that fairy tale. They obviously want that fairy tale because the information, really, a lot of the information is out there about the complexity and about my father's infidelity and about, you know, it's out there. People could have found it if they wanted, but they persisted in clinging to this fairy tale. And, um, there, you know, but then as my, my parents, you know, their their presence began to recede in public consciousness, we thought, well, you know, what the heck? Why, you know, why not, why not present the world with 
with the real fairy tale, which is more complex and and you know, as and messy I write, and chaotic gives, and painful. Gives them, yes, and it gives them. It also gives them more credit. Exactly. I mean, honestly, I always say. Yeah, at the end of the day, really, honestly, when my father was unwell and, you know, he was, it, it was, you know, as everybody knows, it was really horrible. And, um, but I really think, honestly, my mother was the only one he wanted in the room. And he, he found her endlessly fascinating. I think that her, you know, ace in the hole, as we say, was that she, um, she knew that beyond a shadow of a doubt, he, he, um, he thought she was the most extraordinary actress in the world. And even though her star was in ascendancy in, in 1957, and I always say, you know, you know, she, she made her own dress for the Academy Awards because she didn't have money for a dress. She had money for fabric and it's gorgeous. And you should look it up dress and jacket lined in green silk Amazing. and made Amazing. French toast and took care of the children and knew ev where everybody was, you know, and, and ran a theater and continued wow. to um, teach an acting you know, acting class stayed on the stage. Um, so, you know, my father found her endlessly fascinating. And his, as his star eclipsed hers, he really spent the rest of his career trying to find projects for them to work on together to prove, as somebody said this in the transcripts, I can't remember who, to prove to the rest of the world how extraordinary my mother was. And they did, you know, directing projects like Rachel, Rachel, which is an extraordinary movie, which was the um, screenplay was written by Stuart Stern um, from a book called um, A Jest of God and um, and the effect of gamma rays on Man in the Moon Marigolds and, Amazing. you know, which was a really difficult time. It's, it, you know, horrible, horrible woman that my mother was playing and she brought it home with her every day. And that was like, hor you know, Method acting, that was a really difficult time for the family, too, because my mother especially was would absorb these characters and bring them home. And, yeah, really, uh, really unusual. Yeah, really freaky. I mean, I could talk also about the gifts that, you know, my parents, that with all the complications, you know, they gave me such incredible gifts of, you know, growing what, what, up in a household. What did you yeah. learn? From, what I mean, there's two things I want to ask you so we can maybe start with this one and then go to the next one, which is mm -hmm. kind of in the modern culture, people seek fame like it is the answer. It's going to give you this golden mm. life and this kind of uh, solve all of your problems. As, as someone who has a lived experience of fame, what would you say to those that want to constantly seek fame through social media or whatever it is? <laughs> a peripheral i well i mean that's the thing it's like i'm a pass through like um i i was uh, signing <laughs> that, books and i was sounds signing a bit like not... your dad saying i don't count <laughs> yeah. that sounds very like your dad well, well at the same time if we're talking about fame i mean you know i'm a i'm a good artist i'm a decent singer i'm a really good mom and i have a great husband you know yeah no i give Those myself credit where credit yeah. is due yeah, they are big things. And especially, yeah. you know, the parenting. I think my children are wonderful. I I think, you know, when I found out I was having boys, that my first thought was, I don't want to release horrible, more, just terrible, and I'm not going to say more. I don't want to release horrible men onto Into the, the planet. I want to make sure that I release good men who know how to sew on a butt and take care of a baby and cook a great meal. And they do. <laughs> so there. Um, Go you. That's a great. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> well, the first thing my mom did when I had boys was to buy them dolls, you know, because so, we're those people. Yeah, um, right. <laughs> um, so, oh, again, so the question being, oh, fame. Okay, fame as seen from, you know, like I said, I'm, I'm a Petri dish. Uh, when, I'm, when I'm at the, the, you know, my father created these amazing camps for children with life-threatening diseases. And they, so it's the Serious Fun Children's Network and the Hole in the Wall Gang Camp. I, I mean, once I start talking about them, it's hard to stop me. So I don't want to go too far. But they are so extraordinary. You can look up our videos on YouTube if you want to find a bright spot in the universe you know that's it, where hope so, is yeah yeah hope where he's goodness. where what yeah what he he started and then everybody jumped on board and, and you know it's a it's a beautiful example of people coming together to create something incredible but he was really the spark and had the idea um fame highly overrated it's why my father was <laughs> so um, you shaking loved. your head right? <laughs> uh well look i'm not an idiot i mean I, it's afforded me 
uh, you know, extraordinary opportunities. It, it, you know, it's, you know, look, the comfort of financial stability is something separate from fame. Um, my father wanted to be a character actor, really, honestly. He wanted to be an actor. My mother came out, you know, on the other end. My mother came out, as you say, she came out of the womb wearing tap shoes. She wanted to be a star. And she was such an extraordinary actress, such a chameleon. Um, you see, every photograph you see of her, she looks completely different. And my father was cursed as a man who just wanted to be an actor, you know, was cursed with these incredible good looks. And, you know, you look at the parts he chose, complex, you know, I would say HUD was one of the first truly irredeemable characters, you know, just screen, from start honest. to finish in that movie. He's, yeah. he's a horrible, horrible man. Yeah. And, um, and my father didn't, you know, he wanted to, he really wanted to push up against that. And the thing he loathed was when someone said, can I look at your blue eyes? Can I see your, because he had a, he had a joke, a running joke saying that his epitaph would say, here lies Paul Newman who died of failure because his eyes turned brown. <laughs> <laughs> it's laughable. But, but that also really leads a horrible self-attack, isn't it? <laughs> and tragic. tragic. Yeah, absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I think if someone had come up to him and said, you know, I want to discuss the work you did and the preparation you did in the films, but who did that? People came up and said, take your glasses off, you know, and it just, I, I, my, my heart goes out. I'm incredibly awkward around famous people. I, I inevitably say something stupid. And to my point, who am I? They don't know who I am. And and yet I feel like I have this peripheral. I grew up with this, you know, people giving me this a uh, weird false sense of glitter something that what you know really had nothing to do with me yeah glitter yeah I've, i was like standing underneath where the glitter was and i was you know yeah and it's not it's not my glitter i have my own glitter you know? yeah but um and, and that's but, what i can yeah, hear being, being recognized well, yeah, i was just I gonna say well, being recognized you, yeah you go go ahead go, go. You can. I was just going to say, you know, being recognized for this, for your outer shell, for things that aren't real, for things that are so subjective, um, you know, what is that really? Being recognized for your, you know, having people really recognize you for your accomplishments, um, you know, which is why my dad loved race cars so much, because... You know, he wasn't that great. He had to earn the respect of race car drivers. They didn't they didn't care who he was. If he could, you know, on the track, if you can't pony up and do your, you know, and he he didn't start out. He he was a really a good person. He he could study. He and he always you know, even with his alcoholism, the reason that his career lasted so long is that he was incredibly reliable. So though, you know, someone might have wanted to hire someone for a party was extremely talented, like a Brando or a James Dean. And I don't, you know, in terms of work ethic, they, they knew that my father would show up on time. He'd be prepared and he would do the work and, you know, to the best of his ability, you know, so, you know, it's, there's nothing more complicated, I think, to grow up with than a high, you know, publicly high functioning alcoholic because th their, their public life isn't going to hold them to account. Um, and, you know, you just deal with this sort of sense of remove when they're home. So I'm, I'm answering 45 different questions. I can't help it. Well, um, I, think, I think what I understand is, and there are so many questions in some ways that they pop up. You, you know, life isn't a straight road where you just go one question and it stops. Mm -mm. It's like there are multiple inputs that are coming through as you're speaking and you're kind of these light bulbs are going off and, and it's fascinating. And I guess what I've understood from you and, you know, what you've learned is that how you were perceived from the outside and if it's quite shallow from how you look or how you're perceived from the outside isn't enough to give one a sense of esteem and worthiness and kind of grounded feet on the ground of being loved and lovable because it's external and it falls away on the skin of your of his beautiful blue eyes or the not the skin yes you know on the kind of and so i think what 
I'm understanding from you and that you've had to work to do this for yourself as a, an artist and a mum and a friend and a, and a wife and a lover and all the different versions of yourself is that it's from the inside that we do the work. It's from the inside that our value comes. And it's really to do with love and connection in the end. That is incredibly well, well put. Um, yeah, and I feel as though, you know, if the, if the idea is to, um, you know, to put out into the world, like, what have I learned? <laughs> what did I do on my summer vacation? What have I learned? Um, yeah, it's, it, uh, it, it's so fascinating to me to look at the way that other people deal with, um, with fame um, and how people navigate fame. It's obviously an interesting study for me. I'm really, if I always say, if I had to have two movie stars for parents, I'm glad I got the ones I got. Mm. Um, the, they were decent the, people. And I think. They were, they were, they were they, with, yeah. With frailty. They were, and then my dad's, have. you know, absolutely. And that one of my dad's ways of dealing with, with his fame and with his luck. Um, and this is the, you know, the, the takeaway it, it wasn't the perfect way. He finally did do the interior work and he really did evolve. And as I said, he was a fantastic grandfather, but, um, but that he chose to give back and he, you know, he really sort of was instrumental in making that blueprint of, of people who use their bully pulpit for, you know, for good. And they try to, to level the playing field um, in some way, you know, whether, you know, in whatever way they can. And I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that he's, I think other people have followed in, in those footsteps. Yeah. And, I, and you know, I think back. he was instrumental in inspiring. Yes. And that giving back yeah. is curative. You know, so it's both. It's where, yes. you know, and that for me as a therapist, I think for all of us, altruism helps the person you're helping, but it also helps the giver. You feel better. And so for your dad, it finally gave him meaning and purpose in a way that he could be proud of and kind of you know there was i had this sort of sense of him this orphan that was this dusty chilly empty place but that it got filled up by the hole in the wall gang by um these amazing camps and the the millions of dollars that he gave away and that 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 was as well as loving you and growing to love his grandchildren in a way that maybe he didn't have the capacity to really connect with you, although he loved you as much. I mean, he talks so much about being a parent in the book. He so wanted to be this version of himself he couldn't find in himself. But it sounds like what you're saying is a grandfather, he did find it. Well, we also lived next door to each other, so we really raised my children together. And that, you know, I have to say, I, I felt deeply connected to my father and deeply loving. I felt as though he was a very fragile man. Mm -hmm. I think I pre-mourned his, his death because I would think about him and think about him not being here. Um, uh, years and years, you know, 20, 30 years, if I thought wow. about it, I would, I would sob uncontrollably. And there was something so fragile about him. And I always thought if my, if my mother were to go, my father would fall apart. And if my father were to go under different circumstances, my mother would have had an entirely, she would have gone on to have another life. She would have been, you know, mourned his passing, but she would have, she would have, you know, moved forward. And um, I really honestly, you know, I'll share this is that I really think that, you know, my mother was diagnosed with dementia mm -hmm. um, shortly before my father was diagnosed with cancer. And I honestly, honestly feel as though my father said, I can't, I can't watch this and I can't handle it. So I'm going to get cancer now. And he got one kind of cancer and they said, you're in such amazing shape. We're going to, you know, we're going to press through this. This is incredible. And you're going to do great. And then he said, no, I'm not because I'm going to get another kind of cancer. And I really honestly feel as though, um, you know, he just, he couldn't bear it. Yeah, and um, and that really mom. says something about, yeah, the un inexorability of, of their relationship as fraught as it was. And they deserve a gold medal award for whatever that was, that thread that held them together, which by the way, had to do, you know, with loving the work, loving the discussion and loving and being, you know, and, and, especially my father finding my mother endlessly fascinating. So that's really sex. quite the extraordinary. Fuck cut. 
that they had unbelievable sex. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, people, people always say, yeah, people always say, oh, you had to say it, right? No, no you, you do have to say it because it's so fabulous. It's so great. People say, how yeah. did you feel about that? Oh, my gosh. People say, well, isn't that embarrassing for you? And I, and I you know, I, it's so funny because I, I live in the house that I grew up in. They bought the house. I bought the house. You know, they bought it in 1961, the year I was born, and I bought it from them, as I say, when my son was two. Um, oh, and it has the double doors on the bedroom with a big bolt. It's like an airlock. And I, when I was little, no idea why that, why why anyone would want two, <laughs> two doors on their bedroom. And I can remember jumping in bed with them, you know, barreling through the two doors and jumping in the middle of them in bed and thinking, and then this is so intimate, but thinking, oh, I love the way their bed smells. You know, I have this like Proustian response every time I think about it, like, oh, what was that smell? And like, now I know what it was. You know? <laughs> yeah, and, and we, you know, somebody my my sister and i my sister clay and i were talking about it and like we're delighted we're delighted yeah. that my mother was a sexual my father's sexual awakening you know he had had children and had a wife and you know that all went you know the way the way it went but my mom evidently was the vixen so she good lit for him her. up she lit him up didn't she yeah she, she really did he discovered yeah. his sexual <laughs> self and that changed his career he did. too because she was suddenly a sexual man. Yeah. Because, but also, like, it, it just, I mean, from the, what I've read is, like, that energy for all the fights, there was an attraction and a fascination and a passion that for all the complexity, that really remained. And that was an amazing bond between them. And amazing to witness as a child, to see that kind of love and... And fun that your parents had great sex. I mean, what a great role model, you know, for you. Yeah, I think it's a, you know, the, like, you know, as I said, you know, fame and stardom are not a, you know, movie stardom is not a blueprint for adulthood. But I, but I did, I did really have, I mean, there was drama in the household and there was because there was drinking and infidelity, but there was also, um, it was I, maybe that was the takeaway for me was seeing the, you know, he would just walk by her and he would do a little, he would just kind of scritch her, you know, just a little between a pinch and a scratch, you know, um, on the arm, ownership. sometimes on the bum, you know. Yeah, it, yeah, yeah. Ownership in the best possible way. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, or, or it's more, I think more of like Piglet and Winnie the Pooh, like, are you there? You know, yeah. like, I just want to make sure you're there. And um, a bid for and affection. I saw it all the a time. A bid for connection. A bid for connection. Yeah, it was just a, a, a confirmation, you know, yeah. a confirmation. I don't feel like it was a request. I feel like no. it was more like a just a, yeah, it was just a, a point of contact. And then, you know, when I think of them always, you know, as we went through life, I, I think of, you know, walking into their house. As I say, they, they lived across the footbridge the river and the children our children running back and forth and a sandbox in front of their kitchen and a sandbox in front of my kitchen and um I just remember you know always walking in and they would always be right in front of me sitting at the breakfast table with my dad's horrible 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 coffee which was like the consistency of mud and you know he's a man who delighted you know <laughs> a movie star he um he delighted in you know a great piece of toast he just joy a, a a, you know, a beautiful slice of melon. So he, he, you know, he understood, he understood the poetry and joy of simple things. And what actually, when he was, um, when he was, uh, you know, uh, he was very, very ill. And I, I, the saddest thing that ever happened was I was sitting out in front of the house with him on a chair and we were sharing an orange and he said, and it, it just, it came, you know, it was a surprise to me. He said, I'm, I'm not finished yet. And it, you know, he would sometimes say these things, but that was really, and so I just said, dad, you have an infinite number of moments left to you. So just, Aww. you know, take, you know, experience each moment as it manifests without judgment. Eat, eat the segment of the orange that is in your mouth right now, you know, and I mean, that's all, you know, that's all, you know, mindfulness poetry yeah, but i think it's it relevant is. and you know i'm and glad i uh, it occurred to me yeah but sad to think that he felt he wasn't finished 
It's sad that he felt he wasn't finished, but it's bittersweet in that he had more he wanted to live for and that he could really savour the taste of the orange and that you could, in some ways, um, encourage him that you have an intimate you know, you have an infinite number of moments. That's a lovely memory for you that you can live on, sounds like. Yeah. I, you know, he would sometimes say things, you know, that felt so intimate. And there were times when I felt like I wasn't prepared and or I was too young. But yeah, that was a, that was nice that at the, you know, towards the very end, um, it occurred to me, you know, that that, that, that was a good you know, we, we, we spoke, you know, at that point, we, we, we spoke the same language. So he, he knew exactly what I was talking about. And I think that, you know, it's a nice, it's nice to hear that in relation to the book, you know, the book is, is, um, you know, a, a really, you know, he, he, he kind of torments himself in the book. You know, you get to learn about his, his, um, you know, is him questioning his validity and his imposter syndrome. And, you know, it's nice to know that after that period of time, which I think it's really important for people to know about that because I think people can relate to it, but to know that he came to a place where, you know, he, he just still felt like he had a lot to give, to which give. means that he came to a place where he understood how much he had given and that he had, that he had more to give. That feels such a beautiful, in a way, end to the conversation in kind of recognizing mm. his battles with himself, his battles with life, which from the outside looked so kind of glamorous and glorious, but that actually towards the end of his life, he could kind of grow within himself and value his contribution and be more at peace with himself. And in some ways, you can't heal, you know, you don't remove the stuff from the past, but in some ways he came to terms with it in a way that he felt more at peace. Yes, um, it's, it's, you know, just honestly hearing you um, summarize it that way, I, I, I thought, well, if I really let myself go, I could probably get really emotional right now and burst oh. into tears. <laughs> so. Yeah. Um yeah. I'll I'll do it after I uh, you know after I hang up I'll have a little boohoo on yeah. my pillow. No, it's really it's it's also really beautiful. So beautiful. I really appreciate the summary. It's I think yeah, I think you did a great job. It's a beautiful book, Melissa, it really is. And I think all of us can see ourselves in it, not the glory and the fame, but the the battle mm. of our relationship with ourselves and the imposter syndrome and the way that we can have this awful shitty committee attacking ourselves, you know, like your dad saying, I don't have a gift for fathering, you know, with your movie star, your three strikes against you before you start, should I shoot myself? But then would Scott be free? I mean, that kind of, anyhow, I should stop right. because we're going off on one. But maybe <laughs> do you have a, do you, as a therapist, do you have a question for me? Has anything occurred to you that you'd like to ask me? <laughs> well, I'm going to find out where you are, and I'm going to come. I'm going to walk into your office and lie down on your couch because I think we could, oh, we could certainly go on. Um, I mean, I think you've summarized things really well. I think that, and you've interpreted them really well. Um, I, you know, I think that the, you know, the, um. The, you know, the experience, the parallel experience, you know, if you want to comment a little bit on the parallel experience of my sort of peripheral fame and my ego development and then my father's, you know, we, you know my, there, and then there was, oh, there's so many directions. And, my, and then my mother, who wanted to be famous um, and was an extraordinary actor, my father who became famous and worked hard to be as good an actor as my mother. I don't know, as there's all those things, I guess the, the, the parallel trajectories, if you want to com comment on that. I mean, the thing that I, the complexity of it, I guess, is how, you know, your dad talked about being lucky, but I think the, the profound kind of recognition is that we, 
have so little ultimate control over how we're seen or what happens to us and we can influence yeah. and shape it and that you know your mum was was very well known I mean I knew her as a brilliant actress and I'm the same age as you well, I'm older than you but um but she but she didn't have that massive stardom um that uh, that Paul had but um I guess what the, the sort of what's crystallizing in my mind and I don't know if it's really clear is in relationships whether it's in partnerships there's competition and rivalry and being children of um being a child of anybody but child of someone who is very very successful adds a layer of complexity because it does feel like your your own sense of identity gets robbed of you before you have the capacity to make it for yourself and develop your own identity and so there's something about um coming from a place of of plenty that there's enough for me and who I am as well as enough for them and who they are and that you can accommodate and allow all these different versions of yourself. But often inside ourselves, we want to kind of tidy them up and have our place and Marie Kondo it. And it's so much messier than that. Mm. Yeah, I always say that everything in life is a spectrum. Um, that, you know, any time we try to divide things up, I mean, nothing, nothing in creation is, there is no straight line, um, you know, there's, this, you know, and I, I mean, I look at things like gender, I look at things, all these things, you know, why do people feel like they have to draw some line in the sand in any way, shape or form about okay. anything? And so I think just embracing the idea that, I always say, if you can subtract hierarchical judgment um, and you can take this vertical line and just turn it sideways and make it horizontal. Um, and to, yeah, to take, you know, rather than saying, you know, something is better, worse. I think that's a bit, yeah, you know, good, bad. It's on some, you know, stacked on top of it's, it's just a trajectory. And also that, you know, as you know, our, our, you know, we say in our, in our, fragile demo uh, democracy um we we have to hold many truths to be self-evident at the same time and these things it's it, you know or or to put it in uh, improvisation terms it's a yes and it's an and yes. not a but you know that you that you say yes this is true and this is also true and this is also true and um i think learning to to do that and not you know to to not you know and to try to subtract, you know, to remove, well, to remove blame, to understand things in context. My well, another one of my favorite things is to zoom out. Yeah, that's like, a good one. We should zoom out and zoom in and zoom out and zoom in because you, once you sort of see the context, you know, like me saying that my, you know, my father was, you know, had such a hard time with his own mother, but then to read about. You know, and the the book takes it back to a certain point, but then to read about in the transcripts, well, she, you know, of course, there's a reason that she, as you say, generational trauma, there is reason that she was the way she was. And then there was a, you know, and, and, you know, you can take it, take it back and back and back. Um, so to understand always to zoom out and see the context of things. And I think that's it. I suddenly lost your volume. I don't know why. I lost your volume. I don't know why. Still recording. I can't hear you. Maybe it's recording your. Ah, she's gone. 